Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, thank you Douglas, thank you Chris. Um, I'm super happy to be here and see all of you in the room. I'm super happy to be in front of this camera where I look like a black outline as well. <coughs> I'm sorry about that. Um, I will probably turn more to the room, uh, but I try to speak as clearly and loudly as I can so you can all hear me. Um, do give a shout otherwise, and hopefully someone will tell me. <coughs> All right, I am super happy to be here tonight to talk about this lovely radiation of finches that are hiding away in the South Atlantic. <coughs> I did ask before I came here um, how to uh, build my talk and whether I should have it very focused. And I got <coughs> the tip, Oop, let's see here if we can start. There we go. I did get the tip that the congregation would probably appreciate some more or less related things about birds and nature and other things <coughs> that you can run into uh, if you are happy and lucky enough to, um, to do some research in the South Atlantic. So I will sort of present you with these uh, finches and their quite remarkable history. There will be interjected some, something about the logistics of actually doing field work to, to try to understand this radiation. <coughs> and then towards the end, when you're all fed up with uh, adaptive radiations, and when you may or may not uh, want to, to ask me questions, I'm going to let uh, the slideshow continue up here, uh, just featuring some, some photos and some video clips uh, from the islands. And I should mention already now that <coughs> several of, of the photos and the uh, clips are taken by Martin Melo and Peter Ryan, who's kindly, who have kindly agreed to let me include those. Right. So, welcome to Tristan de Cunha. Uh, this is the Tristan-centric worldview. Uh, quite a lovely one, I think. When you approach Tristan, um, you might not quite realize that you're there, but hiding in those clouds made even harder to see with all the light in this room, so you may all have to re-watch <laughs> this presentation online later. Um, but there is uh, the main island of Tristan da Cunha. <coughs> of course, getting to Tristan is not super simple. Uh, you did see that it's situated in a far away part of the world. So presently the only way to get there is to go by boat, uh, or rather by ship, I should say, uh, from South Africa. I have been lucky to do one round of field work. Uh, it is over a decade ago now, uh, when we went to one of the islands. <coughs> so we went left with uh, uh, a research vessel. Of course, if you're on a research vessel for about seven days, uh, there's nothing better to do than to sit outside and look for seabirds. Let's see. And if you're lucky not to have Tristan, you know, hiding away in clouds, you can get this beautiful welcome. So here you see a, a sooty albatross, which is one of the characteristic species of the islands in front of Tristan uh, main island uh, just after some, some beautiful snow covered the tip. This is probably my best uh, bird picture that I've ever taken. Um, I'm not much of a photographer, <coughs> but for those of you who are, I will tell you that I took this with a 50 millimeter lens. So you can imagine that you get quite close to, to the seabirds. Right, so just some uh, brief photos to show what doing research on the islands can be like. Um, this is <coughs> from one of the islands that has the very um, suitable name, Inaccessible Island. Uh, if you see the cliffs in the background, you, you can probably figure out why. Uh, I will also mention that even though 
you get there by ship from South Africa, that will take about a week. Getting on, on land onto the main island is possible. There is an actual dock. Um, getting on land of, on any of the other island is a bit more challenging. So we were lucky <coughs> to be on the research vessel and this was on a research trip. So we were chopped it off to get with all, all our stuff. And on this island uh, of Inaccessible, there is actually an old hut uh, that has been built specifically for doing research, which is a blessing. So in the lowland, this is sort of our base camp. <coughs> Whereas in the highland on the plateau, <coughs> uh, you would have to live in tents. Of course, you have to make do with, with what you can find. So I am also featuring our beautiful shower. And on Tristan, <coughs> and more specifically on Inaccessible, you are quite isolated. So the only ways of, of communicating with any other part of the world, being the, the main island of Tristan, is to climb up onto the plateau and use uh, a sat phone. Uh, so this is really only for, for emergency and, and logistic coordination. And this is a photo, uh, one of several, of Peter Ryan. And I should say already now that Peter is, is the one who start, well, who's done a lot of work on the Tristan Finches. Uh, he's done a, several field seasons, both short and long ones. And much uh, of what I present today is built upon uh, the data that Peter has uh, collected, the sample he's collected. So really, um, Peter should have uh, much credit for all of this. And when I said you have to climb the plateau to be able to use the sat phone, it's not a super simple feat. It is about 450 or so meters elevation uh, that you need to cover in not very much longer, um, sort of in, in, in the flat distance. So it's very, very steep. This is me uh, going down after uh, an intense day in the field on the plateau. Right, so that was a bit of <clears throat> behind the scenes of the field work. I should give you a proper welcome to the Tristan Acuna Islands. Um, so the archipelago is officially the most remote um, islands in the world that have any human population. There is a human population of 200 and, well, last I knew it was 267 people, uh, but that might be outdated now. Uh, probably not dramatically so though. There are three uh, islands in, uh, in the group. So it's Tristan, the main island, there's Inaccessible Island, and Nightingale Island. <clears throat> and these vary in age. So they're volcanic islands that have nev never been connected to each other. Uh, Nightingale, which is oldest, is about 18 million years old. Whereas Tristan, the youngest one, is still an active volcano. Uh, so this is showing <clears throat> the three islands. Like I said, Tristan is the youngest. Inaccessible is somewhere in between, differing quite dramatically in age. They thereby also different in, different, uh, differ in topology. So Tristan being an active volcano, inaccessible being sort of half eroded, so it has these steep cliffs and a plateau on top. Whereas Nightingale, which is the smallest island, is just sort of a little, a little hump uh, sticking out of the ocean. And I do want you to note uh, sort of the geographic scale here. The islands are tiny. So Nightingale Island is only four square kilometers. Inaccessible is about 14 square kilometers. And Tristan uh, considerably larger at 96. So can I ask what's the distance between Tristan and Nightingale? Yes. Uh, I think it's, I have a scale somewhere there, 10 exactly. So it should be about 35, 45 kilometers. Thank you. Yeah. Um, and I, the reason why I want to imprint that these are small islands is that it's relevant when we introduce the, the main characters here, which are the Nisus Pizza finches. So <clears throat> on the main island, we leave that aside for now. 
Uh, on Inaccessible and Nightingale, there is a pair on each island of a small-bodied, small-billed finch and a large-billed, large-bodied finch. <clears throat> and if you look carefully on, on these heads uh, that are on, on the slide, you can see that the phenotype, so the way they look, is a little bit more extreme on Nightingale Island. <clears throat> So the small-bodied, small-billed finches are a little bit more small-billed, and the large-billed finch, finches are a little bit more large-billed. You have the same pair on, on inaccessible, but they're a little closer to each other. <coughs> and traditionally, of course, <coughs> it was assumed that this was one large-billed species with two different subspecies on the two different islands, and a small-billed species with two different subspecies. Now, uh, of course, I said we left Tristan da Cunha out. We're not entirely going to do that. Because I should also mention that there used to be small bit finches on Tristan, on the main island. However, uh, people came, rats came, sheep came. So these uh, small bit finches disappeared quite quickly. And the taxon is only known from a single specimen. It's been assumed that they are the same as the small build on, on inaccessible. But we will get back to that. To complicate things more, <coughs> on inaccessible, you have the large build finch, you have the small build finch, and in some parts of the island they behave as two different species. In other parts of the island, that again is 14 square kilometers, they hybridize wildly. So you have intermediate hybrids ranging all the way sort of across the phenotypic spectrum, from small will to large bill to anything in between. And this is quite mind-blowing to me, at least. Um, <clears throat> and before we go into where the different types are and how this works, I also thought that I would show you uh, some of the field work. You all probably know that the, the most common method for catching passerine birds when you're doing scientific uh, studies is using uh, mist nets. So I didn't include that because we very rarely use that because being on you know, an isolated island, the birds are not really scared. So the most efficient way of catching them is usually doing this. This is Petri in action. The dramatic swoop, and we have a bird. Quite efficient. Here we see a uh, large bill bird from uh, from inaccessible. Uh, nothing fancy, but it's nice to you know see that they're actually live creatures. So this was just interjected before trying to break down what birds are where and why they mix in some parts and why they don't in others. So, um, this all depends very much on the habitats of the islands. So, I've swapped things around a bit now. You have Nightingale Island to the left, inaccessible to the right, and in light green, and little dark green patches and, and blobs, is what covers all of Nightingale Island and the lowlands and slopes of Inaccessible Island. So this is a, a grassland um, dominated by Spartina grasses. And in the grassland there are solitary trees or little copses uh, of the only tree that grows on the island, which of course is another endemic. Uh, so the, these are phylica trees or island trees. On the plateau of Inaccessible, on sort of the western half or so, there is a quite low nutrient wet bog fern heath. So it's dominated by uh, these sort of tranky looking ferns um, and blechnum. There are not that many birds around um, here at all. Whereas on the eastern half of the plateau, you find again the phylica trees. But here they form uh, a woodland 
and the trees themselves look very, very different. So instead of, so instead of looking like very nice, dense trees, they sort of grow very spindly and, and strange. And they also don't produce much fruit here. And the fruit that they do produce is smaller than the fruits that they produce in the lowland. So this is important because <coughs> The birds, the finches, they eat their finches, so they eat seeds. And the small billed birds, <coughs> they mainly eat grass seeds. The large billed birds, they eat almost exclusively uh, the seeds of the fruits of the phylica trees. In fact, they're so specialized on, on phylica fruits that they start feeding the chicks phylica fruits immediately, which leads to a large proportion of the chicks of the large-billed birds choking and dying. So they are very, very, very specialized. And you know, when you try to model how, how speciation or how selection uh, and, and trait evolution happens, you often try to simplify things, right? So a lot of the modeling of how differentiation and speciation happens is actually done in sort of simplified resource landscapes that are more or less bimodal, which most part of the world you don't really find it because it's much more complex. But on the islands, on these very remote islands, the diversity is not huge. So what you actually see, and now I'm torn, but I'm going to try to point here, is that it's hard to see, but this is seed mass on the x-axis. So in this Spartina and, and Phylica habitat, you have a huge hump that represents loads and loads of small grass seeds. And then there's pretty much nothing in the middle of sort of medium-sized seeds. And then you have that lower hump that represents the Phylica fruits. So you better be good at either eating Phylica fruits or grass seeds. But if you have something intermediate in terms of bill size, you're not very well adapted. So this is true for Nightingale, all of Nightingale, and it's true for the lowland of Inaccessible Island. And you may note, remember that the, that the phenotypes were a bit more extreme on Nightingale. You can also see that actually the fruit size, the seed size of the phy phylica trees on Nightingale are also larger. <laughs> Now, if you go to the third panel from the top, you find this wet bog fern heath. There's not too much there. Whatever is there is small, so little seeds. And when you get to the final cap woodland on the eastern part of the plateau, <coughs> you have some small things. You also have a larger, a, a hump of larger things that corresponds to the final fruits. Again, not too much in between, but I should add that this is covering uh, seeds only. In the woodland, there's another feature as well. It's very rich in, in arthropods. So there's lots of little nice spiders and other things that you can sort of supplement your diet with. And perhaps not surprisingly, given all of this introduction, <coughs> the birds track this resource landscape to a T. So here for the same landscapes, <coughs> you can see uh, diagrams of how the birds distribute according to bill size. So now <coughs> this is the bill depth across the x-axis, and then just number of birds measured. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, and you can see that on Nightingale and on the low, in the lowland of Inaccessible, you have small bill birds, you don't have much in between, and then you have large billed birds. Again, the large billed birds are larger on nightingale because the fruits of the phylica seeds are larger. On the plateau and the third panel, you find only small billed birds. But then, when you get to the woodland, things get kind of crazy. So here, as you can see, there is a distribution pretty much across all, all available phenotypes. So, in the woodland and in the ecotone between the woodland and the, the wet heath, there is suddenly no assortative mating. 
So when you're in the lowland of an accessible island, if you're ever lucky enough to get there, you will stroll around, you will watch the finches, and they will have, you know, a small billbird and a large billbird will have overlapping territories. They will behave as two different species. There's no, uh, no way you could sort of ever get the idea of anything else. And then you climb the plateau and move a kilometer or so, and suddenly you see matings in all fashions. So they will have, you know, small build, mating with large build, intermediate with small build, intermediate with large build, or intermediate with intermediate, all combinations. And it works because there is no fitness cost in being intermediate if you're in this habitat. So a pair of intermediate birds or a pair of small build and large build will do just as well up there in terms of producing uh, young as sort of the pure uh, pairs will do. So to me, this is, I mean, it's crazy. On a tiny, tiny, tiny uh, area, you have this system that behaves like two different species in one part of the island, and then in another part of the island, they just mix wildly. So I mentioned that traditionally it's been assumed that the large billed birds of the two islands sorted into one species, and the small billed birds on the two islands sorted into another. That may not be the case. This is uh, a phylogenetic tree. Here I'm just showing all the Tristan finches down here, and just showing that they <coughs> sort of branch off to, to outgroups uh, on the mainland and on the Falkland Islands. And the split between the Tristan finches and all of the others is about three or so million years ago. And then we will zoom in on that little part that is in, in the square, in the box. And here you can see that the birds group quite clearly according to geography. So the tree sort of splits in the middle, one branch leading to all the birds in, in, in accessible islands, although mixed. So the large build and the small build birds in an accessible island, they are just in one big jumble. On the other branch that leads towards Nightingale Island birds, they split between large build birds and small build birds. So there's a clear division. Which makes sense, because on Nightingale Island there is no hybridization happening. So there will be no uh, sharing of, of DNA between the large build and the small build birds. Whereas, as we know, in an, on an accessible island, whereas you can see them looking different in the lowland, we know that they mix up on the plateau. Oh, I should actually go back and point out another thing. So I did say that all of these, or the ancestor of all these finches split from other finches in South America and the Falklands about three million years ago. That means that the finches should have arrived to the Tristan Islands about three million years ago. And if you remember from, from the overview of the islands, that means that that's before Tristan was there, so we would have had an accessible and nightingale. But we can also see that <coughs> looking at genetics, it looks as though nothing happened for a very long time. Well, we don't, of course, know that nothing happened. But what we do know is that all of these finches of today, they coalesce back in time to about 100,000 years ago. So they arrived 3 million years ago, but today's radiation is only about 100,000 years old, which is very young, especially for producing so, uh, so different uh, phenotypes. So, I will not go too much into uh, technicalities. Oh, there's fantastic feedback in the room now. <clears throat> but we have, I started this as a part of my PhD program a long time ago, slightly longer ago than I care to admit. Um, and 
the project sort of has advanced as technology has advanced. So we started off doing more traditional genetics, and then we have employed genomic methods. So we have sequenced the full genome of these finches, and we have sequenced the full genomes of multiple of each type of finch. So if you do that, and you look across the whole genome of the birds, this is the simplified tree that you get. So you can see that on one branch is all the inaccessible birds. They come out as one big group. And on another branch, their sisters, is the pair of small-billed and large-billed birds on nightingale. So this, for example, can be seen if you look at variation across the whole genome for a whole lot of individuals. We included almost 200 individuals here. But in two parts of the, region, of the genome, to, I was about to say tiny, but that is not true, but it, in two isolated parts of the genome that are about half a million to a million base pairs long, which sounds a lot, but you have to consider that the whole genome is a tera base pair, so it's less than, well, yeah, it's less than a per mil of the genome. They actually differentiate so that instead we see the grouping according to morphology or their phenotype. So the two small bill birds on nightingale and in, inaccessible in, in respectively, they group together as most closely related and the two large bill taxa group together as most closely related. So this gives an indication that while sort of the signal is probably lost in most of the genome because there is continuous hybridization between old birds and inaccessible, something in their genome must still code for the differences that we see, right? Because the small bill birds have a small bill and they have a small body and the large bill birds have large bills and bodies and that needs to be encoded in, in their genes. And I will not dive into this, especially given that time runs and technicalities and technology are against us. Uh, but I will just say that one of these regions is on an autosome, so one of the chromosomes that all, all uh, birds share in two sets. Uh, and it sort of makes sense when we look at what the genes in this region do in other organisms, we can find that in chicken, this region is associate, associated to growth rate. So while we have not sort of pinpointed the one mutation, we have a reasonably strong case to, to assume that this is related to body size. Another region on one of the sex chromosomes, the Z chromosome, which <coughs> occurs both in males and females, but with two copies in males and one copy in females because birds are sort of inver the inverse of, of uh, humans, for example. So the males have two Z and the females have a Z and a Y. On the Z chromosome, we find another region that associates with phenotype, <coughs> so with bill size and body size. And this actually also makes a lot of sense because some of the genes that are in this region are known to feed directly into the neural crest differentiation pathway, which is literally what shapes uh, the beaks of, uh, of birds and the faces of, of, of humans and other mammals. So it's, it makes perfect sense. Now, I'm not going to walk you through the graphs because <clears throat> I don't think we have time for that. So suffice to say, uh, interestingly, there's not only an effect of what genotype you have in this chromosome 1 region and an effect of what you have in the chromosome Z region, but there is also an interacting effect. So it's not simply additive, but depending on the combination, which again gets a little complicated because males and females will have varying number of copies.
but depending on the combination you will have sort of extra multiplicative effects as well. So basically there's like the small allele and the large allele, so the small and large version of, of the genes or this region that will determine whether you become a small build finch or a large build finch or an intermediate finch somewhere along the scale. So while again we have not nailed it down to the exact mutation doing exactly what, we can see that these two region to a very large extent determine what these finches uh, will look like. So <clears throat> I'm just going to talk a little bit about how this all makes sense or to some degree makes sense on an accessible island where we have a lot of dispersal within the island. I should say there's not much dispersal between the islands uh, and where we see a lot of gene flow and where in some parts of the island we see complete reproductive isolation and in other parts not. So just to cram it all in on one slide, our eye here is reproductive isolation. And just to summarize, on Nightingale there's full reproductive isolation between small build birds and large build birds. <laughs> birds, large build birds. This is getting hard. And we can see that across the genome they are, have become very, very different. Actually so different that it was very hard to find these two regions because they have just, because of their small population sizes, also had a lot of random mutations becoming fixed in the population. So they look very, very different. Maybe even more different than they are. And there's no gene flow. There's no interbreeding between small and large built birds. On inaccessible, like I've gone on about, in one part of the island, the lowland, you have full assortative mating, so there's entirely, they are entirely reproductively isolated. Small build birds will only breed with small build birds and large build with large build. Whereas on the plateau, you have no reproductive isolation, no assortative mating, and full gene flow going on. Obviously, if you move, if you're a bird, moving from the lowland up onto the plateau and into the woodland, you're doing well because you're fine whatever you look like. And you can find a mate that looks pretty much any way you like. And you can mate. But for birds to move back from the woodland on the plateau down into the, in the, into the lowland, that really only works if you are more or less small build, sort of traditionally small build, or more or less traditionally large build. Because if you're intermediate and move back into, into the lowland, remember we had this big peak of small seeds and then there was the phylica fruits and there's nothing in between. There's nothing for you to eat. So there's a very asymmetric gene flow. So I'm going to try to wrap this up uh, by just talking a bit about what this means for imagining what the speciation scenario has looked like. We know that they initially colonized the islands <clears throat> about three million years ago. Uh, we know that they would have, the, the ancestor would have been small build because if you look at the whole clade of birds in, on the mainland and other islands, they're pretty much all of them small build. And they would have spread to Nightingale and Inaccessible that were the islands that were present at the time. Then at some point, this large build phenotype would have evolved. We know that it would have taken quite some time, uh, partly because the genetics tells us so, but partly also because the phylica trees did not arrive to the islands until about one million years ago. So for about two million years, there would have only have been grass seeds to eat. So they would have been small build, all of them. Then on one of the islands, we cannot know which one. Um, after the phylic arrived, there was suddenly a, a selection pressure for favoring birds with larger bills. And given that we see this, this uh, variation in size between the islands, where Nightingale has larger seeds of the phylica, and Inaccessible has smaller, and even yet smaller in the, in the woodland, it is likely that sort of the 
the finch has started to eat the, the phylica seeds. And maybe there has even been some selective responses in the phylicas that they have evolved larger fruits to escape predation by the, the finches. But however you imagine it, it's hard to imagine that this divergence into a small build and a large build bird would have happened other than the birds actually still being on the same island. Because it would make no sense to assume that on one of the islands, the small bill birds persisted, whereas on the other island, suddenly they all evolved towards a large bill. Because through sort of the geological development of the islands, there's still always, pretty much always, large parts of, of grassland. So it would never be only phylica trees available. So that would be known as sympatric speciation, which is something that is quite controversial um, in the field of speciation. Because most of the time when we get new species is because you have an original species that sort of ends up into different parts of the world or parts of a continent or parts of a geographic area and they were isolated for a long time physically. So long that they sort of evolve towards different uh, phenotypes and when they meet again they are reproductively isolated. But here it would have happened on one of the islands. And then I said that there's not much dispersal happening but we do know that they occasionally do fly between the islands because we know they're on both islands and there are some indications that it still happens, although very rarely. So there would have been, at least the new large build form would have dispersed to the other island. And then on one of the islands, Nightingale, they would you know, evolve towards two reproductively isolated populations becoming true species. Whereas on the other island, so <coughs> inaccessible, we have this very complex uh, system where they are reproductively isolated and behaving like two different species in the parts of the island and they are mixing in other parts. Right. That is a little complicated. I will admit that. Um, but we can always make it more complicated. So before I let you go, <clears throat> let's return to the Tristan finch. Remember that one bird that was collected on the main island? Never to be seen again. Well, that one bird luckily has been seen again, but the, the taxon as such uh, disappeared from the, from the Tristan island very rapidly. Ever since I started working with these finches, I have, of course, been very curious as to where it fits in. Uh, it has been assumed that it is the same as the small build birds on Inaccessible, just based on what it looks like. But it's hard to be very sure if you only have a single specimen to, to compare with. Um, and back in the days, about a decade ago, when we started all of this, it was sort of unthinkable, uh, not unthinkable, but it would be very challenging to think that we would find some sort of genetic marker that would make it possible if we could get just a tiny bit of DNA from an old historic specimen to actually determine something. So back then I was hoping to find, you know, maybe one little part with one little mutation that would sort of sort the different taxa. Now things have happened quite rapidly <clears throat> and Luckily, uh, the ma massive high throughput sequencing of DNA has been much, become much more efficient and much more cost efficient. I would almost go as far as to say cheap, but that is not entirely true, but it's doable. So as a side project, uh, I and Alex Bond, so mine and, and Douglas's um, colleague in Tring, we launch this side project and together with uh, Sidke Pregen uh, who is um, curator in Berlin and who kindly uh, gave us minuscule sample of a tissue uh, I extracted some DNA from it and we ran it through massive throughput sequencing and lo and behold <coughs> oh I'm a little slow with my clicks 
we would expect if this was indeed more or less the same thing as those small build birds on an accessible island, we would expect that it should sort of come out here somewhere in the group, the clay that contains the inaccessible island birds. It did not. Instead, it branched off quite far from all the uh, finches of today. So all of the finches of today, whether on an accessible or nightingale, are much more closely related to each other. They diverge within the last 100,000 years or so than they are to the Tristan finch. So this will make for some interesting taxonomic and nomenclatural um, uh, dilemmas as well, but it adds a layer of complexity to an already quite complex system. But in a way, it also makes some sense, because this single individual gives us a, a snapshot showing that whatever lineage was on Tristan seems not to have diverged into a large build and small build finch. There are no records of any uh, large build birds ever being on Tristan. Um, and it seems like there had not been any dispersal either. So whatever was on Tristan seems to have been isolated enough to never get gene flow coming in from large build birds after they developed. And Remember that I, I said that it was a bit of a conundrum because the finches arrived to the islands three million years ago and then the phylica trees arrived about one million years ago. But all of these guys, they seem to date to the last 100,000 or so years. Well, now we know that the, the system, including the, the Tristan lineage, at least sort of pushes that date back quite a lot. We can only speculate about what has happened, you know, before that. There might have been lineage, lineages uh, evolving and disappearing, getting extinct. That is something that we sadly will never know. Uh, but I think it's quite fascinating to see that this, this Tristan individual actually represents a distinct taxon. Right. With that, I would like to say thank you all of you in the room who have been waiting for Zoom to connect and reconnect and so on. I would like to say thank you everyone who has actually endured uh, Zoom and all the problems that we've had. And I would like to acknowledge uh, all of many uh, co-authors on this study and particularly highlight uh, Martin Melo, uh, whom I was doing fieldwork with together with Peter Ryan in the middle here. So Mr. Nisus Pizza Finches, uh, as well as Bengt Hans on my uh, former supervisor. <laughs> I am going to say that, um, I'm just putting this summary up here if anyone wants to have a look. Uh, I will be very happy to take questions. I'll just remind you that um, while it's hard for us in here to, to appreciate the photos very well uh, due to the light, uh, I included a bunch of other extra photos and video clips of, of birds and scenery from Inaccessible. So I'm going to let that roll. Hopefully it will also sort itself. It may mean that you get so mesmerized that you don't ask any questions, but we'll see. Uh, but with that, I would like to say a proper thank you. Yes. So it's difficult to say, but what would be the taxonomic um, implications of what you're saying? Well, you'll have to read the paper by uh, Sir van der Bond et al. No, uh, I mean, I would say this is a very particular system because, yeah. you know, traditionally it was presumed to be a large wilderness world with species with different subspecies. After us realizing this, it's been treated as two different species on Nightingale Island and one species on inaccessible covering all of the finches, which I think is sort of the best you can do um, uh, with <laughs> how strangely they behave. Given that, if we then find these small build birds that morphologically are not all too different from the small build birds on inaccessible, but clearly have been separated for a long time. And like I said, it's also hard to properly quantify just how different they are because we have a single specimen. 
So we don't know the variation. I think it would be very hard to envision anything but treating the Tristan bird as a separate species, which actually then is bearing the name bearing type for Nisus pisa acuñae, uh, which suddenly means that the birds on an accessible island no longer will be Nisus pisa acuñae. They will instead be Nisus pisa danae, which is now the large billed uh, subspecies. And then, uh, yeah, so there will be a bit of a, a carousel. But effectively, it means that we should recognize one more uh, lineage in the Nisus pisa radiation, one more species. Thank you. Right, do we have any questions? Sorry, that, Ashwini. Yeah. So I'll just briefly repeat the question so that you on Zoom hear it. The question was whether build depth, so build size, is affected by how many copies of a large or, or small allele that you have. And the answer is yes. So I sort of browsed past that because I felt stressed about all the, the Zoom problems. But yes. Uh, basically, if you have one copy, you will be less large build. If you have two copies, you will be more large build. But rem remember that we had sort of the, the bill region that definitely directly affects the bill. But then we also had the region affecting body size. And of course, body size and bill size are not entirely disconnected because it's hard to have a large bill if you have a tiny body. And it, if you have a large bill, to some degree, you will also have a larger Sorry, what did I say? If you have a large body, to some degree, you will also have a larger bill. So yes, there are additive effects on bill size or bill depth from both these regions. And then there's also epistatic effects. So there will be an interaction. It's not just that you sort of get bigger and bigger, but you get a boost if you get the combination and get massive. I'm going to let the D Douglas moderate. Uh, sorry, just to say, um, if anybody does have any more questions, if you want to put them on the chat, then I'll be very happy to articulate those. Yep. So put questions in the chat, and Douglas will ask them. Um, sorry, did you have any more questions? Yeah. Uh, I just wanted to ask, so I know you briefly mentioned, but how would you sort of explain the situation of the youngest island? Yeah, it's a good question. So why does the youngest island have what seems to be the most ancestral form? So I would like to push back on that. I would say that it does not have the most ancestral form. I would say that it has one lineage that dates back to the deepest split. So. Yes, it's easy to think of it as the sort of the ancestral variant, and perhaps in some way that is true because it's small build, and we know that the ancestors were small build, and it seems like there were never any large build birds coming to Tristan. But I don't agree that that is necessarily more ancestral than anything else because they all sort of coalesce back to the same uh, ancestor on the islands. But having said that, you're right. Uh, so Tristan de Cunha is estimated to be about 300,000 years old. I'm not going to vouch for the exactness of these geological datings. And I will also not say that when I said that it was about 500,000 years old, uh, the split, that is also not exact. So this is basically quite roughly dated with a molecular clock. So what does make me uh, somewhat happy is that the time of divergence that we can estimate from, from the molecular data at least roughly matches how long the island has, be, has been there. So it sort of seems to make sense. But did you use the age of the island as molecular? No, this is just uh, molecular dating. Yeah. Uh, two questions which yep. may not be related. Is there any difference specifically in the plumage of the different and is the radiation, if the radiation is linked to 
for the change in the botanical structure of the island. Do we know what drove that difference in the botanical? Right. I will try to answer that. I also did see that Mike Fraser, who has a personal interest in brightly colored birds, uh, has asked a question about uh, uh, plumage variation. <clears throat> so there is some variation. Uh, most, I mean, if you look across all of the finches on both islands, other than morphology and shape, they look pretty much the same. They are all sort of greenish yellow finches with really no plumage characteristics, pretty much. Except on inaccessible, <clears throat> in uh, parts of the island, and this is again on the, the highland, so on the plateau, you do actually find small build finches that are much, much more bright yellow than in the lowland, and then the ones that are in the woodland as well. <clears throat> so these have been, uh, coined as the subspecies Fraserine, which may sound familiar uh, from our question, our, our question, uh, Oscar Mike Fraser. Um, and they do differentiate somewhat from the other small wheeled birds. Uh, so there is some genetical structure. I would argue that uh, it is much less compared to what all of what is going on on an inaccessible island because you get you know everything from small little birds to large little birds and everything in between so I'm not sure I'm not sure that I personally would uh, call them uh, subspecies they are a distinct population or a distinct part of the population uh, and the reason why they are much more brightly colored yellow is because they eat oh I should really remember the name of the berries is it Nemertea, perhaps? My apologies. Yeah, they they eat <laughs> berries right. that are making them looking much more yellow. Yes. And well, is, is the radiation, uh, what is it, if it's linked to the vegetation, <clears throat> do you know what has influenced the difference or the evolution of vegetation on the island? Uh, to some very rudimentary degree, I do. Um, I do know that there is still, I mean, the, <clears throat> the flora, just as the fauna, is still very sparse. I mean, it's not, uh, it's not a very high diversity. So like I said, you have these grasslands that are dominated by one, one genus. Uh, and really, the only trees on the island is this one single species. Then, of course, the habitats, uh, they progress as the geology of the islands progress. So these are all volcanic islands. So they would have formed as you know, a, a volcano rising from, from the ocean. It would have been all bare. And then presumably been colonized by you know, the, the opportunists like grasses and so on. And we do see, I mean, we're lucky in that sense because we have Tristan, which is much, much younger. And we can see what Tristan looks like now, which is basically, again, a lot of, of grassland and some, some uh, phylica trees. But it's more complex because the, the topography of the island is more complex as it is younger and has more elevational zones, for example. Thank you. Thank you. I don't know if you're getting questions directly to you because I'm not. Ah. Them, so that might be. Gotcha. Yes. I think that I might have been the only one I got, which may also have meant that I should not have reply to it to everyone, but that happened yeah, now. Yeah. <laughs> um, any more questions before? That is a great question, and I should be able to answer it. Uh, no, I know that it arrived to the islands, or it is estimated to arrive to the islands a million years ago. I would have imagined that it should have arrived fairly rapidly to Tristan <clears throat> after it formed. Um, but I'm not sure there are any, well, there would be records. I mean, there are, um, there has been a fair bit of geological research happening. So there's been a fair bit of, of you know, cores taken out. 
And I do know that there are old um, you know, records from the sediment, but I'm not quite sure I know whether there are like any, any specifically dated ones from a very long time ago in Andresden. But given that they're so close, <clears throat> I mean, it would be surprising if it did not, if seeds did not disperse yeah. fairly rapidly with, you know, with birds. Yeah. No, it's true. <clears throat> yeah. No, I mean, if if there are no phyllic, phyllic I mean, <clears throat> for large billed birds to be on Tristan, um, you would need phyllic there to eat, and you would need the, the large billed birds to arrive there in the first place. So you're absolutely right. When was the Aha. You know what? I thought today that I. This is something I should really look up <clears throat> because I should know that. So yeah, is when it was collected. It's in the 1800s, uh, and I. It's embarrassing, but I do not remember when. I think possibly Douglas is googling it now. Maybe who knows? <laughs> <laughs> yes, exactly. Ashwin. Uh, so, if you know what kind of water kind of island, you can say that it's not from the volcanic islands that are there, and it's not from the island. That is a great question. Uh, and no, there have not been other islands that have been there and then sort of sunken into the ocean again. So, if you look at sort of uh, the profile, those three are the, the islands that are around and that have been around for you know, the past many, many million years. Um, obviously, who knows, there might be another one cropping up at some point. Um, and Nightingale certainly is on its way to, to be submerged. Uh, it's not a lot sticking up there. So we'll see. Okay.